Loving God and Heavenly Father, we pray that you will increase, we will decrease. I pray, Lord, that uh, your word will come with its power to be able to touch the hearts of people, that the seed will be sown and it will take root, um, and none of the distractions of this world will go out choking. I pray, Father, that you hide me behind the cross with the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. I do not be a single word I speak that is not according to your ordained will. But I pray, O Father, that your will be done, and your name, Jesus, will be magnified and glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Florence H. Hadwick, born 1918, died 1995, was known to be an American swimmer, and she was known for setting many records, but the one that got her to the claim of fame in the swimming halls of history is the fact that she is the first woman to have swam the British Channel both from England to France and from France back to England uh, in both directions and uh, she set many other records since she was age 10. But what, what, what I want you to recognize is in 1952 she took the task of having to swim between uh, California coast over to St. Catalina Islands and as she swam it was a 26 mile swim now, uh, the distance was not something that she was really apprehensive about because she, swam, she had swam larger distances. It was the frigid waters that she was concerned and the, the fact that the waters had sharks in it. So she had these guideboats that would go around with her, along with her mom in one of the boats and the other ones that would watch out for the sharks. She swam for about 15 hours and as she came towards the coastline, a deep a dense fog set in. And as the fog set in, she could not see. And she, so she continued to swim in the direction to where she thought she was going. And uh, in, for another hour she swam, and then she finally called it quits. In retrospect, when she was reflecting on that swim, she was one mile away from shore when she quit. I want you to have uh, keep your thoughts on that, and then we'll get back into scripture. And I'll come back as to why I told you the story. The theme verse for our church is from Second Chronicles chapter twenty, verse fifteen, which is the battle is not yours but God's. I won't get to that section of the text today. In subsequent ser uh, the services, I will get to it. When the goal gets tough, where is your focus? Is the title of the sermon today that the Lord wants us to hear? I'm going to be telling a lot of stories, and you know when you tell stories, I tell stories because it's an easy way for us to remember great truths. I'm going to be telling a lot of stories. Jesus told parables, which are essentially told stories, but which by which we can take some real doctrinal, top deep, deep truth and apply it to our lives. Now, the good thing about stories is it keeps you, you know, uh, attentive. It's easy to actually reflect the truth, but there's also a downside of stories. So while I was actually preparing for this message, and uh, I do, I was running it by my beloved wife, Samita, uh, I was telling her these stories, and we were in Dallas, and as I was going through the portion of the scriptures as we were going through and telling the stories, I saw her suddenly do this. Right? She was in bed, obviously. So was, she goes, so get the, the, she was kind of falling asleep, and I'm like, Sax, how can you? This is so amazing. This story is so, so beautiful. How can you go to sleep? And she looks at me and she goes, Duh, Mom, that, have you not heard about it? bedtime stories? You put children to sleep, right? Now, why do you do when you tell stories? But here is something that I will tell you. Though. Yes, when we talk to our children and we tell them stories, we put them to sleep. But that is not to be done in the church. Okay? How, and there's actually an example from scripture, so I'll start with that story. If you turn, if you actually, you don't need to talk about it, Acts chapter 20, verse 7 to 12, it talks about Paul who is in trials. And Paul is over there preaching. It says that they got together on the day when they were to pray bread, much like how we would get together on Sunday to, to worship. And as he's preaching, he says that he started to preach and he went up to midnight. Now there was a young man, a guy named Eutychus, who was actually sitting on the window, and he fell into a deep sleep, it says, and he fell off the window. The only problem is that when he fell off the window, it was three stories high. So when he fell down, he fell down to his death and he died. So Paul goes down and he embraces him and he tells the people, he says, Don't be troubled, okay? Life is in him. And he resurrects him. It's actually a miracle of resurrection that takes place. So I want you to recognize one thing though. There is a warning and a danger. If you fall asleep in church, you could die. Right? 
and resurrect. But while there is levity in that, every time in church when the message of God is preached, it is a call for us to die to self and to be resurrected, to walk in the newness of life. I actually want to tell you all here something. When my birthday comes, you think about gifts that you want to give me. I love to get a gift which says, you know, sleeping during sermons can cause you death, and on the other side, and resurrection. Right? Yes. So, I say that from a story standpoint because I want you to pay attention to how much truth and depth is there in the scripture. Turn with me to 2 Chronicles chapter 20. When the growth gets tough, where is your focus? The world will actually tell you to complete that statement. If you go to ask the person to the people around the world, you ask them to say, when the going gets tough, what do they say? The tough get going, not be bigger. When the going gets tough, where is your focus is what I want you to recognize. The four sections that I will cover today, the main idea of the outline is this. The first thing is, verse 1 and 2 talks about the reality of the battle. Verse 3 and 4 talks about the right response to the battle. Verse 5 to 11 talks about the request for help during the battle. And the last verse that we will talk about today is verse 12. The recognition of one's best position in the battle. Verse 1. It came to pass after this that the children of Moab, the children of Ammon, and with them other, besides the Ammonites, that's talking about the people from the river of Mount Seir, the Edomites, or some versions would say Mayanites, came against Yehoshaphat in battle. Then, 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 then there came some that told Jehoshaphat, saying, There comes a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea on the side Syria, and beyond they be in Hazazon Tamar, which is Engedi. If you read that verse carefully, it says, After this. Now, when I went to Dallas Theological Seminary and got my uh, Master's in Biblical Theology over there, uh, one of the things that they teach you, and I'll tell you a trick that they teach pastors, is when you, the Bible doesn't explicitly tell you something that's evident and there are words like therefore or after this, alright? They teach you this mind blowing trick. Are you all ready to hear this? Okay, somebody say, I'm ready. Okay. If it says after this or therefore, you've got to look before this. So if you're in a chapter, that's the mind blowing trick. Okay. If it is chapter 20 we are in, in order to understand what this after this is, it's actually to go back to chapter 19. And what you see when you go and read chapter 19 is that there is a reform that takes place. Jehoshaphat has actually reformed the land in the city of Judah. And in all of the cities of Judah, he's appointed judges to be able to take matters of the state, to be able to handle matters of the state, and governance and all that stuff. Then he appoints officers, or Levites as officers, and priests in all of the cities of Judah. So he takes this and actually appoints leadership in terms of man managing matters of the state and manage managing matters of the spirit, church and state. So Joseph had done this reform. But the Bible in chapter 19 doesn't actually start with that story. It in fact starts with the story where it says this. It says that Joseph had returned from Jerusalem and he had come back to Jerusalem. So he had returned to Jerusalem in peace. Okay? So he's coming from somewhere we know. And he's coming back to Jerusalem and he's coming from a place that potentially did not have any rest. And so he's coming to this place where there's peace and peace. And then he's met by a man over there. And this man is Jehu. And Jehu comes up to him who is the son of Hanani the prophet. Now I'm saying these names because God will give me a time as we go through I will have the opportunity to be able to share about the other truths that come from Hanani the prophet which actually has a tie into the story. God will give me have the time to go there. But at this point Jehu the son of Hanani comes over and he tells Jehoshaphat this is how he greets the king. King Jehoshaphat, why are you helping the ungodly and loving those who hate the Lord? Not a very easy and a good thing to be able to tell the king that. Flat out, straightforward, no mincing words. Should you not, but why are you helping the ungodly and you're loving those who hate the Lord? Now he says this, and then he says, Because of this, the wrath of God is on you. Nevertheless, you've done some good things. 
and those good things have not gone unnoticed. What you've done is you've brought reform into the land. You actually set your heart to seek the Lord, and you called the people back to the Lord, and you went and destroyed the idols that were in this land by the word idolatry. But God was not saying that Jehoshaphat, I'm good to you because you did some good things for me. But God is essentially talking to Jehovah was this: whatever you are doing that is evil is noticed. Whatever that you're doing is good is noticed as well. In other words, everything is plain and clear before the eyes of God. There is nothing that you can hide from His sight. And so Jehu says this to Jehoshaphat, and then Jehoshaphat reforms. He changes and he actually brings the people of the land and appoints leadership in order for them to be able to rule. And he says, "May the Lord be with you and be courageous in doing that which is right." So it means all of your leadership has to be with the God of this universe, with Him being the center in your decisions. So I want you to start there, but then I have a problem now. It talks when Jehu is asking this question, and he says, "Why are you helping the ungodly? Who is he talking about? What do we do if we don't know where the text is evident over there? We go back. So we are in chapter 19 of Second Chronicles, which we see is where we learn about Jehoshaphat's reforms." So we have to go back to 18. 18 chapter 18 introduces two kings. King number one is King Ahab, who is the king of the northern kingdom of Israel in a place called Samaria. King number two is Jehoshaphat, who is the king of Judah, the southern kingdom. So two kings, Ahab, Jehoshaphat. We don't know what reason it is, but it says in the very verses in the beginning of the chapter, chapter 18, that Jehoshaphat sought to have affinity. Towards this King Ahab, with some versions of yours, we're going to say he sought a marriage alliance with this king. So he ends up going to this. Uh, he ends up going to uh, visit this King Ahab, and Ahab throws a huge party. He kills, slaughters so many of these oxen and these camels, and he throws a big party. And the Bible says somehow Ahab persuaded Jehoshaphat to go to battle with him. Against the king of Syria in a place called Ramoth Gilead. Okay, everybody tracking so far? So he goes to meet this king. The king persuades him to go to battle with him. Now Jehoshaphat does something which is beautiful. In fact, says before we go to this battle, he says, "In fact, says I will go with you. I will actually, you know, it was better. It was marriage, uh, alliance, relationships, or what we don't know." But he says that I will go with you. But before we go, shall we inquire of the Lord? Let's ask the Lord if we should go to war. And this is what Ahab does. He calls four hundred of his prophets. Four hundred prophets come, and essentially they sing the same same song. And this is what they tell him: Go in, go in Syria. In fact, one of the prophets he ends up actually creating horns, and he says, God is pushing Syria out. You know, so you will go and you will be victorious, and you will you will be you will be successful in your mission in this attack against Syria. Now, the warfare between Syria and Israel, we have to go back a few more chapters, but we won't go. I won't take you far because if we keep going back, we will go up Genesis, and we will be past midnight that we will be here for. Right? I can't start to keep you up to midnight. In fact, in that story when Paul goes and resurrects Eutychus, he comes back and he preaches, and he preaches all the way till daylight, which means he preaches for a whole night. That means the people were burning to hear the word of God, and Paul, but the Spirit was speaking of it. So we will stop there in verse of this chapter in Peter. Now I may go to chapter seventeen, God willing, in time, time permits. But in eighteen, what happens is that he says, "Shall we inquire of God?" Four hundred prophets come and they actually give him a counsel to say, "Go do this, and you will be victorious." Jehoshaphat said, "Hmm, something's not right." That level of unity. That tremendous unity with everybody saying the same things. So Joseph is like, "Is there not one prophet of the Lord that we can inquire of?" And he had the other king goes, "Ah, yes, there is one, but I hate him." And he actually is telling him as to why he hates him. He tells him, "I hate him because he never says anything good about me. Every time he is prophesying, he is only prophesying evil." But they have the faith to realize that he was the evil king, and there was nothing good to say about him. So whatever was being told by this prophet, and this prophet's name is Micaiah, and Micaiah, from which we get the word Micah. Now Micaiah means who is like Yah, who is like Yahweh, who is like Jehovah, who is like God. 
He was the voice of God that was telling the king that he needed to repent. Now the Bible also teaches us in the, in the book of Kings that Ahab was such an evil king that God had to put an end to that evil. I will actually see what happens in the story when that becomes very clear and evident. So as God is telling us, he says, there's this prophet called Micaiah. Micaiah is not going to say anything good. Joshua then says, no, don't say that, yeah, don't say that king. Call him. So they send their emissary, they send messengers to go and bring this Micaiah. When they go to call him, the messengers tell Micaiah, this is what they tell him, hey, you're going to be asked this question that can we go to war against Syria at a place called Ramad Gilead? And 400 of the king's prophets have said in unison, in one ascent, in a call, go. So you may not be very wise for you to stand against that. You may want to. That's the fallacy of groupthink that we often see in our corporations where nothing comes new because everybody just conforms. They conform. So the Bible teaches you do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed with the renewing of your mind. Romans chapter 12. And so the fallacy of truth, and then also that my majority, the minorities, voices are put down. So Micaiah is being told. Now Micaiah says, I will say what the Lord tells me to say. As long as the Lord lives. You know what that means? God cannot die. So what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to follow the Lord. I'm going to do what I have to do, which is to follow the Lord. And I will say what. So Micaiah comes. He comes down in the presence of the king. And he comes down to um, uh, Ahab and Jehoshaphat and says that they're seated with the royal robes. And then Ahab asks, what counsel do you have for us? Do we need to go to war? What do you think Micaiah would say? Micaiah says, go, you will prevail. Now I was like, this is a curveball. This doesn't compute. Did Micaiah just fall to the peer pressures and the pressures of the people? Or was he actually still speaking the truth and not lying? Because of the person, it looks like he changed the story and he lied. But he said that I am going to speak what the Lord speaks and tells me to say. So is there more to the story? We better keep reading that text in chapter 18 of 2 Chronicles. Now Ahab, he's like, this doesn't compute. <laughs> he's always been telling evil about me. He's now telling me good. So he's like, tell me the truth in the name of the Lord. To Micaiah. And Micaiah says, you will go and you will surely die. Actually, if you read, if you read, if you read the Bible with me, that's not what he says. Micaiah makes a prophetic, profound announcement. This is what he says. He doesn't tell anything about the demise of the death, the impending doom of the death of Ahab. Instead he says, I see Israel scattered like a sheep without a shepherd. And the Lord says, they have no master. Jesus will actually remind us of that when he comes. When he will see you in Jerusalem and he will weep because they did not know the time of his visitation. Where he will weep because he will see Israel scattered like a sheep without a shepherd, shepherd. So he makes that announcement. It's actually from Micaiah, from the words of a godly prophet. Now, as he says this, Ahab reads, he looks at Jerusalem and says, See, I told you, you will never tell anything good about me. Micaiah interrupts that conversation. And this is where it gets really, really interesting. If you look at chapter 18 of 2 Chronicles, what becomes so interesting is God gives to us by the beautiful rendition of His Word in Scripture, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, a glimpse of what is taking place that is not evident to the eye. It is more than what meets the eye. And this is what Micaiah says. I saw the Lord in the heavens. And there were armies of His angelic armies on His right and on His left. And the Lord asked a question to his host, to the armies, and this is the question the Lord asked. Who is going to seduce and entice Ahab to go into battle at Ramoth Gilead and die? So that he will fall there. This is God asking because God had enough of the evil that this man had done. If 
you go and read the book of 2 Kings, you read that from 18 to 22, it talks about how evil Ahab was, that so much so that he was a pain for the Israelites, and he was bringing dishonor to the glory of God, and God is like, enough is enough, I am done with you. But he's asking in the heavens a question that would seem so absurd. We would be like, God, how can you even say that? In our own, in our little bit of what we think is justice. But God was keeping him from doing even more greater evil than what he had already done. Taking advantage of the poor, oppressed, with the, with the video of Babylon, and the way he built all the temples and the, the idols and the Asherah poles to worship there and go away from God. To be able to be focused on the world and the world religions and the pagan systems instead of actually worshiping and glorifying God. And God's like, I have had it. And at that point, God basically says, who is going to do it? And there is a commotion in heaven because the angels do not know how to answer. The Bible actually says in 2 Chronicles uh, of 18, and they said to one another, and they didn't know what. And then a spirit steps up. A spirit steps up into the presence of God and says, I will go and do that. Now, I struggled with that text. There was another curveball that was thrown. I was like, I don't know what this is. Because when God asked the spirit, where are you? Meaning to say, how come? What are you going to do? And he says, I am going to be a lying spirit. I will go and influence and entice the prophets of Ahab, the 400 prophets, so that they will all entice him and they will let him go to battle. Alright? So he trapped me over here. So, I'm like, so I asked my wife, um, what, what's the spirit? I'm not trying, I'm not getting this. And she reminded me of the time of Job. In the time of Job, the sons of God is actually had met and sat there standing before God. And Satan, who is traveling to and fro on the earth, is coming and finding himself presenting himself in the presence of God. And he asks permission to go and, you know, harm Job so that Job will be son of God. So the first thing we establish and we ask anything in the spiritual realm is under the sovereignty and the power of God. They can do nothing without, in fact, just God himself tells to, uh, to Satan, you can go and do anything and everything, but you cannot take his life, which means life is in my hands. He has no power to kill us, as some people would otherwise think. He may be in his ways and his schemes, deceiving us to make us think that he has all this power, but Satan is laid it up. His rule is coming to an end. He's just in position and power like a laid up in government. He's got absolutely no authority. But then, so, so this could be Satan himself. We do not know the Bible doesn't teach us, so I'm not going to actually say one way or the other. It could be a fallen angel, or it could be a demon that we would call a fallen angel. We know that it would not be a holy angel because they were in commotion and they cannot lie because they are following a God who is not a God of lies. Whereas the father of lies is the devil, in John chapter 8 verse 44 it says that he was a great deceiver and a great serpent and he is from the very beginning the father of lies. So this could be any of either the satanic host or it could be Satan himself. And God says, go. But what's actually interesting is God tells, and you will prevail. You will actually prevail in tricking all the 400 prophets into thinking that what they are saying is right. And you will entice Ahab to go to battle. God gives us a glimpse of the spiritual warfare that takes place that we may not actually even perceive if we are not aligned in the spirit to even sense it. So four of the prophets come and say this. Jeremiah is furious with Micaiah. He actually imprisons Micaiah. He says, put him to, uh, you know, if there's more details that I'll keep the, the details up. But um, I would recommend that you go back and read second chapter, second chronicles chapter 18 and actually validate the scriptures. Test it out. Make so that you can fall more in love with God, who is so amazing. So Micaiah is put in prison. And it says, before he is put in prison, the king says, put him in prison and actually give him just the prisoner's peace. Give him very little ration. So that when I return, and as Jagas Yeh is saying, when I return, Micaiah interrupts him and he says, if you return, you can go to battle. If you return, then this people will know that what I have spoken is not the truth. That I'm a false prophet. However, if you do not return, the word of the Lord will always do what it says. So I have spoken the truth. So Micaiah is taken to prison, he's put in prison. 
Jehoshaphat and Ahab go to battle. I don't know why Ahab joined them to battle, but here's where the story gets even more interesting. I'm like, I can't have enough, right? And it's like it gets more and more with the builds up. Jehoshaphat and Ahab go to battle, and Ahab tells Jehoshaphat, I'm going to disguise myself and I'm to go in a common soldier's uniform. So they will not identify me as the king. But you go with your royal robes. Now I'm like, if I was Jewish I'm like, what is happening? But I don't know why Jewish agrees to go in his royal robes as the king in the battle. But as Ahab goes to battle against Ramad Kaleya, they had Ramad Kaleya against uh, the king of Syria. Now, Lord, in this great infinite wisdom, he can use pagan uh, rulers. And the king of Syria has told his army, don't fight with anyone. Don't fight with the largest of the land, the smallest of the land, don't fight with anyone, except fight and kill the king of Israel. But where is the king of Israel? He's uh, disguised. So they go into battle, the captains of the armies of the king of Syria, they end up chasing Jehoshaphat. Because he's in his royal robes. They're like, oh, that must be the king of Israel. He's in his royal robes. They go after him. Jehoshaphat is part of and he does what everyone should have thought. He should not even have aligned himself with this, this evil king. And he has supported this person who hated the law. And he essentially, he cries out and says, the Lord helped them is what the Bible tells us. So the Lord helped him by diverting those people that were there that were pursuing Jehoshaphat and actually turned them away. And as he turns them away, Jehoshaphat is escaping, where is King Ahab, who is actually gone into battle? He is some soldier somewhere fighting. The Bible is so beautiful because it says, and a certain Syrian soldier, some died, okay? He took his bow and his arrow and he shot an arrow at venture, meaning randomly. He shot an arrow randomly, and that arrow finds its way as flying through the armies. And it finds a gap between the armor and the breastplate and pierces this guy who is here. That is the beauty of our God. When you would say, oh, maybe coincidence. I'm like, I don't think so. When God targets, it is precision targeting. We better not be on that receiving end, unless it is His grace. When he executes judgment, it is perfection. There is no randomness. This soldier may have randomly shot. The gap may have randomly appeared. But that person was marked. And God said, I see Israel with our shepherd. They have the master. So Ahab tells his charioteer, take me away from the scene of battle. The worst thing that a believer can do, when the Titanic sank, the captain went down with the ship. This guy over there is thinking for himself again. He said, take me away from the sea of battle. He goes out by sunset. Air is dead. After this, now we go back to chapter 20 of verse 1. After this, all that I had to tell you to understand the context in which God operates and how he is so amazing. He will not ever allow evil to go in this. He is there establishing the fact that you cannot align yourself with evil so much so that you are being questioned by a prophet and his son, the son of a prophet saying, why are you loving those who hate the Lord? Why are you helping those who are evil, the ungodly? So he comes over here, so the end, so Jehoshaphat has come out of this and he's now come to this place, to Jerusalem, in peace and there is supposed to be peace that is to rule in the land and while he is in that place with the reform that he has taken the attacks start to come the tough the going gets tougher three kings the children of the Moabites the children of the Ammonites and the Mennonites or the Elamites from Mount Seir three nations come to attack Jehoshaphat and that's what we read in verse 1 and 2. And they come and give him a report and they say, he, they had a great multitude. They had a great multitude that has come against you. Alright? So try with me. The battle is real. That is point number one. Point number two, if we go to verse 3 and 4, it says, And Jehoshaphat feared 
and he set himself to seek the Lord. This is essentially the right response to the battle. Now Joseph had feared, which actually is a little intriguing because I'll tell you why when we talk about the great multitude. There's a great multitude of an army that's coming against Jehoshaphat. He is now afraid, but he, instead of fighting back, he sets himself, it says, he resolved himself in his heart to seek the Lord, and he proclaims a fast in the land. Everybody, you can fast, you can deprive yourself of your satisfaction of your flesh, so that the power of the Spirit can work through you and in you, and by you, the people that are leaving the land, that are coming. The battle is getting stronger. I don't want you to take up arms instead. Take up the word of God. Get out of your knees. Pray fast. And so he resolves himself to seek the Lord. And what's even more beautiful is the whole city responds. The cities, all the cities of Judah. This for those of us who are in leadership, we have to take this. When you follow the Lord, you are in a way, in a sense, influencing that others follow the Lord. If you don't follow the Lord, you are in a sense influencing that others don't follow the Lord. So we hear it's very clear. All of them seek to ask for the help of God. They are not coming to seek to ask for the help of Jehoshaphat. They are asking for the help of the Lord. And they themselves sought to follow the Lord. They sought to seek the Lord. So the question that I'm going to ask you is this. When the battle is coming full steam against you, what is our response? Are we resolving in our hearts to seek God and to declare a fast, depriving our own selfish desires and seeking and asking God for it? Or are we? What is our usual prayer? God, these people, is, let's say, imagine there's an army that's attacking us. God, be with us, give us victory. Isn't that our prayer? In whatever situations of life, we essentially tell God what, he, what we think He needs to know as to how we want to fight the battle. Instead of just seeking the Lord, declaring it fast, that is what our heart should be. That's the prayer for my wife, Sanita, for my son, Ruben, for my son, Itai, for myself and for our church, for ACFI. That we seek the Lord and we ask for His help. We declare the fast and put our selfish desires away so that we can actually follow the Lord. That is the right response to the battle that comes against us. Let's move on to the next verse. And this next portion is actually, I'm going to go fast on this. Well, this portion is about the witness for them for the Lord from verse 5 to 11. And Jerusalem at that point, he actually does this beautiful, beautiful prayer. And the prayer where he starts off and he says, O God of the heavens. He recognizes that God is not just the God of the earth. He says, O God of the heavens, are you not God? This was not Jerusalem that we arrogant against God. He said, they tell us that you are the one. You've got to make it evident to us that you are the one. Are you not the God of our fathers, the ones of the heavens? It says in verse uh, uh, 5 onwards, and Jerusalem, Jerusalem stood in the congregation of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O Lord God of our fathers, art not thou the God in heaven? He doesn't stop there, he goes on and says, And rule us not over all the kingdoms of the heathen or the kingdoms of the earth. Not only are you the God of heavens, but you are the kingdom of the earth, you are the king of the earth. Meaning to say that anything that happens on this earth, no matter what decisions happen, you think that the world leaders, the powerful, powerful uh, uh, prime ministers and presidents and all these folks decide the fate of a country. No! It is God who allows that to happen. If Pharaoh was increased to power, Pharaoh was increased to power so that the name of God can be beautifully manifested and magnified in the victory that he will bring his people against Pharaoh and Egypt. And so he says, you are the God of the heavens. You are the God of the earth. And then he goes on from there. It's so beautiful as he keeps going on and says, you in your hand have power and might. While these mighty forces are coming against us, it is you that we can rely on. Because you are the powerful one. You are the mighty one. And then he makes it really personal when he says, you are not just the God of our fathers. You are not just the God of heaven. You are not the God of the earth. You are not the one who is You are not, the, you are not just the one who is powerful and mighty. But you are our God. Are you not our God? You are our God. So he's invoking the great mighty power of God to say we are your people. 
And then he goes on to say, I do not the God of God who drove out all these people. All these things in the past that came, all these inhabitants that came against us, because you promised your, your friend, he says, it was Abraham his friend. Abraham believed God and was ready to turn his righteousness. Genesis chapter 15 verse 6, it says that he was declared as a friend of God, who God did not want to keep anything away. And to him you said that to the seed of Abraham, that is us now, standing over here. And by extension, by faith, there is us now, sitting and standing over here. I you have promised your benefits, you promised your inheritance, you promised your, pos uh, your possessions. All of this you have promised to us. And are you, why are you not acting? That is his prayer. And so he's saying, God, show up. And then he goes on to say, that promise, he invokes the promise knowing that the one who made the promise is faithful and true and he will keep it. No matter what the situation is. It could be the entire world that is coming against you. But, the beautiful thing is, if God is on the side, the world will lose. And so he goes on and then he talks about, in this place is a sanctuary that is built. And there is actually a very, very beautiful verse uh, uh, 9 when it says, in this land is the sanctuary that is built. And you have said that sanctuary, your name is being declared. Which means that we own the identity of being the people of God, that our identity is not in anything else but us that we are followers of yours. And in that, this sanctuary, your name is declared, and it is said there that we declare this strongly, and he says, in my sword of judgment, or some version would say sword judgment, or the sword of judgment, meaning to say that if the sword comes against us, if death comes by war, or if there is disease by pestilence, or there is dearth by famine, no matter whether it is death, disease, or dearth, it is said, when we call on the name of the Lord, you will hear and you will help. That's what he's saying. He's not reminding God of peace. He's recognizing God for who God is. You can bring death against me. You can bring disease against me. You can bring dirt and famine where I have want and need. And it doesn't matter when we call on your name. When we call on your name, Lord, you will hear and help. This ties beautifully as we will summarize this. And then he says, now look, these children of Moab, these children of Amon, these children of Mount Seir, Edomites, they're coming against us thinking that they have all the might and the power and the strength and all their stuff to take us away from the land that you have promised us. They're not fighting against us, they're fighting against you. That's essentially what he's saying. This is a beautiful prayer. There are some beautiful, beautiful prayers that are there in the Bible. <clears throat> Nehemiah's prayer for the restoration of the temple is one that we read in the book of Nehemiah. This is another prayer that we all have to know and recognize and remember in our hearts. Where Jehoshaphat is making this declarative praise and prayer. But then I don't know. So this is the response of the request for help in the time of battle. But he doesn't end here. He goes on to verse 12 where he says, I need to now recognize my position in this battle. And it is the anchor verse for our text today and our study today when he says this beautiful verse which we all ought to actually say. This is the kind of prayer that God wants to hear when he says this. He says this in verse 12. Oh our God, will you not judge them? He starts first by invoking the name of God. Let me tell you something that is really, really beautiful and interesting in scripture. He now is calling God to be judge. Yehoshaphat. Yehoshaphat means God, Yahweh, is judge. That's what it means. And Yahweh has judged. He said, I bear your name. You are judge. Now judge righteously. And that's not where he stops. This is where he goes on from there. And then this is the recognition of our position before the Lord. My brothers and sisters, I want you to recognize this. It's so hard for me to do this. This is what we all ought to do. When he says, we have no power. There is no might against this great army. And then he says something that a king of, you would not expect a king to say. We do not know what to do. Really? You are a man with the, you are a king of the place. You do not know what to do. But our eyes are on you. When the going gets tough, where is your focus? 
who are you looking to? Think about that. He says over here, I have no mind against this. Let me give you something about Jerusalem. I told you I won't take you back, let me take you back for a second. Let me, let's go back and say, so you don't need to go back to 2 Chronicles chapter 17. It says that Jerusalem had mighty men of power. Okay? I'm not very good at math, so I'm going to ask somebody who's good at math to help me out. He asked a commander, that commander, this is actually recorded in 2 Chronicles chapter 17, verse 13 to 19. And it says he had a commander, and the commander had 300,000 people who were mighty men of war. How many do we have? 300,000. So help me out, somebody. He had another commander who had 280,000 men. So how much did he have in total? 500. 500. This is the trick that the teachers in BTS to make sure you're still awake. Okay. So 580. Then he had another commander, two commanders, each of them having 200 each. So Nine. that is 580 plus. 90. I lost some of you, didn't I? When I said that. <laughs> I was the person who got lost in math, but 980 my wife says. And then he had another commander who had 180,000 men. 1.16 million soldiers. Jerusalem's army had not faced war, but he had already built up soldiers, 19 men of valor, with commanders in place, with 1.16 million soldiers. And this king is being told a great multitude is coming against you. And he is saying, I have no might. I do not know what to do. But I'll rise all of you. Dearly beloved, this is just as much a message to me as it is to you. Florence may shadow. She swam that 26 mile and fell short of a mile when she started swimming because there was a dense fog. And she gave up and quit because she could not see the end. She could not see land. Two months later, she went and attempted that same swim between Catalina Islands and Catalina Islands and California coast. And as she was swimming, after about 15, 16 hours, the dense fog set in. And she, at that point, continued to press forward because she said, I had a mental image after she finished that race, she finished that event, that swim. She said, I had a mental image of the land because I knew it was there behind the fog. She saw what she did not see. When battles come against you and me, are we seeing the invisible hand of God fight that battle for us? We don't have to fight that battle. Get on your knees, fast, pray. Let the Lord fight your battles. In fact, that's what we'll be seeing in the next subsequent studies as well. We're bringing that to you in terms of uh, the battles is God's, not yours. But before we get that application, the reality of the battle, Jehoshaphat found himself because of his allegiance with the evil king to be in the middle of a battle. Are we putting ourselves in nobody's business in the works of our life, whether it is in war or in some school, wherever it is? Putting ourselves in places where we ought not to be and being aligned with evil. Here's the thing though. The Bible never tells us that uh, Jehoshaphat showed any kind of affinity or love or anything. But the way God looked at his alliance with Ahab, you love the person who hates me the most. That's how God looks at our allegiance. So God wants us not to have anything to do with evil. Who are you associating yourself with? Warfare is not merely physical. There is a spiritual dimension. That's why sometimes you see, how can this be God that you allow this to happen? The common question of the world is asking is like, how is this evil possible in the world? If you are a good God, how do you allow evil? Not to recognize that the evil first comes from within us. And the greatest of evil that was done was not against mankind, but with people that the world kind of comes in churches, attacks the churches. The greatest kind of evil, if I dare to say that even, which I should not, is that it was done against the Holy Son of God who was righteous. God against God, so that he could not be against man. That is evil. Against your holy, pure God. And so, we ought to be righteous for him. To set ourselves so that we follow him, seek him. The right, the reality of the battle is this, and that's why Ephesians chapter 6 to the church of Ephesus is written. 
Put on the full armor of God because your fight is not against flesh and blood. It's not against humans. It is against principalities, against powers of darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. In the heavenly realms where God is asking, who is going to entice this evil person to go to his doom? And the demonic forces are in control over there to come and do God's bidding because God loves it. God is not a human. He never can be. You cannot take light and darkness. You can't mix them. You put on the light and darkness freaks. It's an impossibility. It's a mutually exclusive situation. So don't blame God for the evil that is in us. We were looking at ourselves and asking, what is it that I had to do so that Lord, you will purify me? That is the reality of the battle. We are fighting against spiritual forces. The right response in this, I don't know what your battles are, whether it's a financial battle that you're fighting, or it's a health battle that you're fighting, or for the thorn in the flesh, which we don't know what it is. But he had a health issue. But in his weaknesses, his strength, the strength of God is what he declares to us. And I praise God for that. We all have a battle. Some of you may be having relational battles. I do not know. And some of us, the worst kind of battle is the spiritual battle where we're fighting against our own. I don't know what the battle is. But I know this. Don't take up your armies. You can have 1.16 million soldiers in your resources. But all the strength and the might and the power. Instead, resolve in your heart. I should resolve in my heart to seek the Lord and to fast and to fight it to let the Lord fight my battles. That's what God is asking us to do. The right response is for us to take a back step so that the commander in chief can go in front of us. And at that time, you have to ask and request for help. You have to pray to God to ask and declare His holiness, His righteousness, His power, and His might. It is, it is imperative for us to be able to do that, to recognize and ask Him. Instead of fighting the battle, let us call on the Lord for Him to come and fight our battles. That's what we have to be doing. And the most important application is for you and me to come down to the realization and the recognition of the fact that we do not know what to do. But our eyes are on you. When the battle gets tougher, where is your focus? I don't know what you're fighting, but I know this when you look unto him. That's why Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, it says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, despising the shame of the cross, endured it, and is now seated at the right hand of God. Looking unto Jesus. Who is this Jesus? Who is this Jesus? He is Yahweh Shafa. He is Yahweh the judge. He is Yahweh God the judge. But because of his great love for you, instead of judging us, he judged himself. He came down and he saw around the world of creation that he created and he said, I see this world scattered without a shepherd. There is no master. He came down. You know, the, the going got tough and tough and tougher for him that the world rejected Jesus Christ, the one who came to give life. He said, I am that shepherd. You are the sheep. I am the good shepherd that lays out my life as sheep. And he went to the cross for us. The cross was the toughest battle that he had to fight. But the armies of evil came against him. That came into effect because of man's original sin. And when they battled against him, instead of condemning all of mankind, he fought that battle. And this is what he did. In surrendering, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He surrendered, he focused, Father, Father, why do you forsake me? He surrendered for us, for you and me, on the cross to fight that battle. And in this surrender, he won victory against death. Death of the war against all of mankind. He won against the disease of sin. And he brought and got us the fruit, the, the abundance. And he won against the dearth of righteousness in man on that cross. That's my Jesus. He loved us enough. The battle got tough. 
His focus was on you and me. Where is your focus? Have you surrendered your battles to God? Most importantly, have you surrendered your life to God? We do not know what our eyes are on you. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the cross. Where you fought for us, defeating death, defeating the disease of sin that plagues us, and defeating and addressing the birth of righteousness. Help us to believe in you so that you who knew no sin became sin, so that we could become the righteousness of God. Help us not to be aligned with the world and bring dishonor to your name. Help us to love those who love you. Help us, a master, to be able to be the witnesses that you call us to, to recognize our position in the balance of life, and to say, Lord, we do not know where our eyes are on you. When it gets tougher, let our focus be on you and you alone. Father, I don't know if there's any of you over here who's never accepted you as the Lord and Savior who's never given that commitment to you, and day to day, by your spirit, by your inspiration, if they're hearing this and they're hearing it, they're saying, I want to be part of the army of God. I pray that they will believe in you, that Jesus Christ, your God's only Son, sent for the salvation of mankind, that you're God in flesh, God incarnate, that you came so that you will redeem us, and that you will fight our battles. I pray for those who are suffering, those who are sick, those who are in different situations of life, and Master. In all of it, I pray that their eyes will be diverted towards you and to be focused on you. There is nothing by chance, there is nothing random that happens. It's warfare that is at its best when we are in your fold. And I pray, O oh Father, that you will look at us and you will not give us the declaration that was given to, to King Ahab, a sheep without a shepherd. Help us to always hear your voice. My sheep hear my voice, they know me, is what it says. Help us to know you, for in knowing you, John 17, 3 is eternal life. To know you as one who loves us and the one who gave himself for us, Lord Jesus, help us to respond to that. And if we are enemy of you, who has already accepted you, Lord, I pray, O Father, that they will be the ones who will go to battle for you, but not fighting in themselves, but they will fight by praying and resolving and resoluting in their hearts to be able to be committed to seek you. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all the things that you seek will be added unto you is what you've taught us, O Master. Help us to live that out. But most importantly, let us be able to seek your face, your grace, your work, your favor, and let us love you, Lord Jesus, because you first loved us. Thank you, Father, for having sent your son. Thank you, Jesus, for having come. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for being with us to be able to teach us the truth and to guide us in the walk of righteousness. Forgive us for the times when we've been hurting you, Lord. By thought, word, and deed, we confess, we ask you that you will cleanse me, you will cleanse and create in me a clean heart, and renew a steadfast spirit, so that we can love you. Father God, you be magnified. Jesus, let your name be glorified. And Holy Spirit, I pray for your presence to revival, for reformation in the hearts of men and women here, the elders of the city and in this land, so that the city will come to you and seek you and ask for your help. We love you, Lord Jesus, and thank you for the cross. In the most majesty of the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen.